The next topic to look at uh, is uh, exocrine glands, which is a fairly simple topic. Um, it's important to be able to distinguish uh, between exocrine glands and endocrine glands and particularly their formation uh, embryologically. They both derive from a downgrowth of epithelium into the underlying tissue. However, exocrine glands maintain their connection to that epithelium and secrete their product onto the surface of the epithelium, whereas endocrine glands lose their connection to the epithelium, become highly vascularized, as shown here, and secrete their product into the uh, uh, capillaries, which uh, generally surround the endocrine gland, and that is then carried to other parts of the body. There are th three main mechanisms of secretion um, of exocrine glands. Uh, there is a merocrine secretion, uh, which you've looked at uh, when you've looked at uh, sweat glands. A and in uh, merocrine secretion, the cells, the secretory cells, um, fuse their little vacuoles with the plasma membrane and the product is then secreted into the lumen uh, of the gland and then carried up through a duct uh, and eventually deposited on the surface of the epithelium. The duct is generally not just a conduit. Uh, it has the ability, in, in, in these glands at least, to add or subtract products from the, um, from the secretion. So sweat glands uh, pull generally water back uh, into the interstitium uh, so that the product which eventually uh, uh, is secreted onto the surface is salty, as you well know. With apocrine glands, um, the apical plasma membrane uh, pinches off and contains uh, the product uh, in a vesicle, which is then secreted onto the surface of the, uh, um, of the epithelium, or in the case of the breast, is stored in, in the ducts of the breast until a stimulus arrives to uh, allow the milk to be uh, let down uh, and uh, this occurs during suckling. And then holocrine glands, such as sebaceous glands, um, uh, secrete the, the whole darn cell. Uh, what happens is young cells are continually formed uh, at the base of the gland. As these cells are pushed up towards the lumen by even younger cells, they become filled up with a secretory product. In the case of sebaceous glands, that's sebum, and eventually they are they burst and the product gets pushed uh, into the lumen through the duct and the duct, in the case of sebaceous glands, fuses with, the, with a hair, with a hair follicle, uh, finds its way uh, onto the scalp. So exocrine glands um, come in two general types. There are simple glands which have a single unbranched duct and there are compound glands in which the duct itself branches. Simple glands can branch, but it's not the duct that branch branches, it's the actual secretory portion of the gland that branches, as is shown here and here. And there's only one duct um, connected to the secretory uh, units. Whereas in compound glands, let's look at this side first, a, a compound acina gland, the duct itself branches and branches and branches, uh, and eventually um, a very small duct called an intercalated duct will, will be surrounded by a bunch of secretory cells, in this case uh, as an acinus. One can have compound acinar glands in which all the secretory units are acinar. One can have compound tubular glands in which all the secretory units are tubular in shape and one can have a mixture compound tubular acinar in which you have both tubular secretory units and acinar 
secret reunits. But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you uh, to distinguish between a compound tubular acinar and a compound uh, acinar gland. These compound exocrine glands, such as the submandibular gland, which we looked at uh, in assignment one, are made up of numerous lobes, which are then divided into lobules. The lobes are separated from one another by pretty large seams of connective tissue, as shown here, and the lobules which make up a lobe are separated from one another by thinner seams of connective tissue. The lobules, at least in the case of the submandibular gland, consist of numerous acini, some of them containing a mixture of serous cells and mucous cells, some of them being purely mucous acini, and these cells uh, which form an acinus secrete into a little duct, and that little duct and other little ducts um, eventually join to form a striated duct, and a str numerous striated ducts join together to form um, interlobular ducts. I like to think of a lobule uh, as a bunch of grapes shown here, each acinus being a grape, and there's a little thin stalk coming out of each grape, which would be an um, intercalated duct, which is not something I asked you to be able to um, identify. And these intercalated ducts then form striated ducts. Striated ducts join together to form an in intralobular duct, a larger intralobular duct, and these intralobular ducts then join together to form a large interlobular duct, such as is shown here. Here's an interlobular duct, and then these interlobular ducts join together to eventually uh, deposit the secretion onto the surface of the gland. Let's not forget these little myoepithelial cells that you were asked to identify in assignment one. They are uh, they lie inside the basal lamina uh, of this uh, of the secretory acinus. These are the secretory cells. These are the myoepithelial cells here and here and here are those arms of myoepithelial cells, the tentacles wrapping around this gland, and in this case they're being cut uh, crosswise uh, and appear as these uh, eosinophilic uh, striations. And these um, myoepithelial cells help to s squeeze the secretion out of the gland into the duct. This is a poor example of a duct, but myoepithelial cells are also found surrounding the ducts themselves. We also need to be able to distinguish uh, extrinsic and intrinsic glands. Intrinsic glands lie in the mucosa or the submucosa of the organ that they serve, and the sublingual gland uh, is an example of an intrinsic gland. The glands that you no noticed in the uh, mucosa or the submucosa of the respiratory epithelium are also uh, intrinsic glands. The parotid gland is an extrinsic gland, as is the submandibular gland, and they lie outside of the organ they serve and are joined to the organ by a long duct. Other examples of extrinsic glands, which you may not think of as glands, but nevertheless are, are the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. 